Federal Drive is presented by GEHA, Government Employees Health Association, proudly providing health and dental benefits to federal employees and their families. Visit GEHA.com. A Supreme Court decision earlier this year overturned the notion that courts should defer to federal agency regulatory authority when agencies make rules to carry out vaguely written laws. That was known as the Chevron Doctrine. The case that sparked the change is known as Loper. Loper is the fishing boat operator that didn't want to pay for a federal monitor it was forced to let aboard its boat. Now several parties are suing the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the agency that made the rule that sparked the Loper case. Our next guest has filed a friend of the court brief with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. He's the senior litigation counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, John Vecchione. He talked with Tom Temin. I guess everyone presumed that the rule forcing the boat operators to pay for the federal monitor went away with that Supreme Court decision, but I guess not. No, uh, at federal regulations apparently don't just go that easily. Uh, I The Loper Bright case was combined with my case, Relentless Vicious Commerce. I represent boats who also have these monitors on it and also have had to pay, would, would have to pay them. And so the Supreme Court, for both my petition for cert and the petition for cert of Loper Bright, we asked two questions. Is she- should Chevron should be overruled, and this regulation isn't allowable under the statute if you don't have Chevron. And the court basically said, we like the first question, we don't like the second question, and they remanded it down to, to the lower courts to decide it. And that's what we're briefing right now, whether or not without Chevron, the agency gets to get its guys paid by somebody else besides the government. All right, then. And just briefly, what does the statute say? The statute says that all the fishing boats must carry observers. So Congress did say that observers had to be on the boats in 1990 if NOAA and Fisheries and Commerce, they're all sort of mobbed up together, um, if they required it. And so nobody nobody opposed that. Um, as far as I can tell and my clients can tell, and they were fishing then, they saw that boats were fishing boats were going to have to require observers to make sure they were following the rules whenever commerce wanted it and nobody opposed it they all said ah, all right it's their fish we, we we can we can live with that then 20 years later 20 years later everyone thought observers were government workers the agency said i don't like how many observers congress is paying for so i'm going to force you into a contract with observers And that's what we're fighting over. 20 years later, they make up a new rule just because it says you can carry observers. They now say, okay, and you can pay and you have to contract with them and pay for it. And in that establishment of the fee, was there separate and renewed rulemaking for it or did they just make it? There was. There was. So here's what happened. They they proposed it. And suddenly all the fishermen said, what? I remember that statute. That statute says in three places you can charge the fishermen for observers. In the Northern Pacific, your li- your listeners might know the most dangerous catch, right? It's out there. It's all the big crab, all the high dollar uh, market, probably the most um, profitable fishery in the world. There, you can charge fees for these observers, but they capped it at 2% of your catch. The Congress said, we'll allow it, but don't kill the guys, right? And then there's this other group, LAPS, which is if you are in a fishery and they know all the, all the players, you can split up the catch and split up the cost of these guys. That's allowed under statute. This is These aren't LAPS. And then foreign fishers. Foreign fishers have to pay a fee because they're coming here. They don't pay taxes or anything. And if they have to pay a fee, and then if Congress hasn't appropriated enough money for the procedure, they can be forced to contract with these observers. That's it. Those are the only three times. Not for my guys in New England, not for the Loper Bright people in New Jersey. All these, we have eight fisheries in the United States. Congress treats them differently and makes different rules for each of them. So they are just trying to say, we get to do this just because we're an agency. And that is very dangerous because it means anyone working in an agency, they could just say, hey, we're going to charge you for this guy. Right. So your challenge is actually fairly narrow compared to what people, I think, assumed because of the sweeping nature of the Chevron overturn. I think it's just a matter of, did the statute allow them to charge for these people who are doing government work? And that's very rare. Congress tells you when they're going to do that. We're speaking with John Vecchione, Senior Litigation Counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance. And just uh, here's a question I don't know the answer to, so that means I'm not a good lawyer. You're you're not a prosecutor. (laughs) You can go ahead. That's right. And that is, when agriculture department has 
poultry and other food inspectors and so forth, chicken sexers and all, and all that. Do those facilities pay for those people to be on board? Now, so in all the years, the six years of litigation, we've asked them to give us one example of this in any other agency where they have required without statutory authorization, like the three times I just told you, where they have been able to have the salaries of the people doing the inspection paid by the regulated. And they haven't given us one example. So I have not searched, you know, the entire administrative record myself, but we've asked the government again and again, we've challenged them in each of these cases saying, who else does this? When Congress wants you to pay for these guys, they tell you. And we wouldn't challenge that. I mean, we challenge at New Civil Liberties administrative uh, illegality. So uh, whether it's a good policy or not, the fact of the matter is they didn't do it. The administrative agencies even wrote down when they're doing the regulation, we don't like how much Congress is funding this, and we don't like how, we don't want to set up a lap because it's too much trouble. That's the one where they split up the catch and split up the, the fees for the observers. They didn't want to do it. So they wanted to get around the very things Congress said they could do to do a thing they can't do so they could get more money. Well, listen, if I could charge you for everybody who's doing my stuff, I'd do it too. They shouldn't be allowed to do it. Understood. And uh, you mentioned the word mobbed up together in facetiously of the agencies. I, I guess it's fair to say that no federal paid for inspector has ever ended up as crab food. So that's good for no, the, oh, the no, fisher no, people. No. But in the larger sense here, than the strict interpretation of rulemaking and of congressional authority within statute. What about the idea of paying people that should be doing work on behalf of the government but privately paid? It seems like there's the potential for conflict of interest there. I guess you're 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 alluding to paying the health inspector to say everything was fine, right? That Kinda, sort of yeah. I think that these folks really are government workers. I mean, they're there's certainly a narrow group of them. They're trained by the government. The, the statute requires all these observers to go through certain kinds of training, and they have interactions with the government. I think they know. I don't think they see the fishers as the people who are really in charge of them. And there's all kinds of federal laws where if you don't pay these guys or you molest them like feed them to the crabs, you're in big trouble. So they are government workers. They are protected like government workers. And I think that all of them see the government as their true master. And by the way, what does it cost, say, a fisherman to have this? I, I mean, fishing economics are pretty close to the edge, I think. Certainly in New England they are, and certainly in the herring fishery they, they were. I mean, it's, it's like, like I said, there, there is certain fisheries in northern Pacific and elsewhere where you, you can make a living or they've closed off. You know, there's no competition, but that isn't New England. Right, so it's expensive. I mean, is it tens It's expensive of and it's low margins, you know. But the cost of these inspectors is... Oh, is it brutal. So it's seven... In the regulation, they say it's $710 a day. My clients have freezer boats. So, and this is something that really bothers me. They stay out for two weeks sometimes. The other fishermen go out for three or four days. And there's a cat. So if you take less than 50 tons of herring per trip, per trip, uh, you don't get any observers. My guys, they could take... They could take... 60 tons of herring over two weeks. Another guy could take 50 tons in a three-day trip, take it back, go out, take another 50 tons, go back, take another 50 tons, go back. He's got 150 tons. He's never had an observer, but my guys are out for two weeks because they fish different things. So there's a lot of craziness like that. But the real thing is their margins, uh, $710 a day is more than the, sa the sailor and the fishers make. It's 20% it's of their profit is what the regulation says. And where Congress allowed this in Northern Pacific, they capped it at 2%, and in laps, they capped it at 3%. When Congress looks at this and actually makes a law, you go and you complain to them, and they say, all right, a little of this, a little of that, and they do things like capping the amounts they can charge you. When agencies do it, they just say, I don't care about you. You're not voting for me. And they, you get 20% hits. All right. And by the way, just to change the subject one more time, what are the inspectors looking at in the first place? Oh, okay. So what the inspectors look at is, first of all, you keep fish of the right size, you catch fish of the right species that you have the permit to catch and, and that what you're out there doing. Then they also check bycatch because one of the important things in fisheries is you don't want to 
be killing fish that you're not marketing. You you don't you want to lower the amount of bycatch because the fish can be hurt. Now sometimes they throw it there alive.